Hello, everybody. Pastor Brent here, handy behind the camera. We are just uh, so glad that we could be with you once again. Um, we are in the book of Nahum, chapter 3, and I'm going to uh, make a prediction that I don't know if I'll finish this week. So I'll leave it right there. It'll either be this week or next week. But yeah, you're right. Short book, three chapters. Uh, we will be wrapping it up. So we'll kind of know when we get to the end of this how much more material I want to cover. Uh, there are some details in 2 Kings and there's some stuff in Isaiah just to kind of complete the whole story of Assyria and Judah that I'd like to put together. So I don't know if I'll get through it all today. But if not uh, today, then we'll wrap it up next week for sure. Let's pray and we'll get going. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again for the opportunity always uh, to present your word and help us to do it well, um, because we know that this is important. And so God, um, just help me to lead the people through the verses and to bring clarity to it, understanding, and then especially application that there's something from this ancient book that can help us live better for Christ today. We do pray for everyone that is following, uh, God, that whatever they're going through this week, whatever they're dealing with, whatever they're praying about, whatever they're thinking about, uh, God, whatever they're preoccupied about, that we will just continue to understand that we can cast all our cares on you because you care for us, and that we can pray and there can be a peace of God that passes all understanding that really will guard our hearts, help us to be secure and sane and unmovable God, because we just trust you. We pray for people today that are praying about some pretty big things, either for themselves or for others. God, that you would be uh, the one that ministers, ministers to them and helps them, uh, Lord, with whatever you feel they need, whether it is something wonderfully miraculous, whether it is just an encouraging word, whether it's a friend dropping by, whether it's just a song that fills their heart, it's a scripture that builds them up in their faith. You're the God that knows every one of us, our situations. And so minister, we pray, and we thank you because we know you will in your own special way. So may we and may this all be a blessing to them in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to jump into Nahum chapter 3 today. And I got a brand new marker out, and guess what? The brand new marker ain't much of a marker. Let's see if we can fill this in. Oh, this one's better. Let's use this one. Nahum chapter 3. We'll just put that one in the back pocket and we'll uh, try not to get things mixed up so you can read it. Again, just a reminder, uh, if you want to see this visually in close, put your phone sideways. Uh, make sure that you get as big a screen as possible or your iPad. And if you have any questions or comments, pastor at EssexGospel.com. I ask that all the time. I am very aware that you are a quiet listening audience. I don't get a lot of feedback. But if there is something you need to share, I got a question, by all means, pastor at EssexGospel.com. And I do my very best to get back to you as quickly as I can. Um, I just encourage you... Um, to do your Bible research, to dig into things, to try to find answers for yourself. But if you can't, or if you've got a questions about something that I said, check it out, pastor at EssexGospel.com. So let me just read a little bit. Again, I'm reading from New International Version, 1984. It's the Brent Bible. You know it's pretty beat up. You know it's been around. It's my favorite. But again, I recognize that this version is now almost 40 years old. And some of the pronouns and things like that have changed. So I always just like to give you a heads up. We're talking about Nineveh here. Nahum is writing about Nineveh. Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims, the crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, the galloping horses and jolting chariots, charging cavalry, flashing swords and glittering spears, Many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses, all because of the wanton lust of a harlot. And of course, that would be the city of Nineveh. Alluring the mistress of sorceries who enslave nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. So it seems like there's some occult stuff here. I am against you. There's that verse again. I am against you that you find 
in Nahum chapter 2, verse 13. God says, I am against you again, and I'm going to land on this one more time. Those are four words you never want to hear God say to you. I am against you. Because if God is against you, there is no hope. Nobody goes toe-to-toe with God Almighty and comes out a winner. Nineveh is going to find that out. And remember, Nineveh is the chief city of the chief empire at that time in that part of the world. And again, their arrogance that I spoke about from last week They feel that there is nothing they can't do. There is nowhere they can't go. They are the top of the mountain. And they forget that there is a God out there that says, I'm against you. And watch this massive city and this massive nation fall to the ground when God says, that's enough. Watch that. Uh, Verse 5, I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will lift your skirts over your face. Again, very graphic. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will pelt you with the filth, likely excrement of some kind. I will treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. All who see you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is in ruins. Who will mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? Notice it says Nineveh is in ruins. Does does that ring a bell with you, Nineveh is in ruins? You know, when I read that, the bell it rings for me comes from the fall of Babylon uh, in the book of Revelation at the uh, very end of the tribulation uh, when God is about to wrap all things up. It uh, it talks about uh, Babylon the Great, that last powerful empire, that that last... um, you know, man-made threat on the earth. Look what it says there. Now, remember from Nineveh 3, you know, uh, probably from Nahum 3, Nineveh is in ruins. Look what it says here um, about Babylon the Great in, in Revelation 18. Revelation 18. Just just interesting, the, the similarity of tone. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. She has become the, uh, become the home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, right? Talks about Nineveh having like a cult-like worship there. Um, look what it says, uh, give her on uh, a little bit later on. Verse six, give her back, uh, give back to her what she has given, pay her back double for what she has done. Um, she will be consumed by fire. Whoa, 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 great city, O Babylon, city of power. In one hour, your doom has come. Uh, again, later on in Revelation 18, whoa, whoa, O great city. Um, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down. Um, you know, all of those kinds of things. A lot of similarities in Revelation 18 with the fall of Babylon, the great. You know, again, end time stuff, I get it. And then in Nahum, uh, chapter 3, and let me get the exact verse. Um, you know, 5 to 7. And it's fall. Again, this is happening in 612 BC. You know, 2,600 years ago. This is happening at the end of the tribulation. But Nineveh is a city that is in Assyria at this time and will eventually be a city that is in the nation of Babylon. And the fall of both is very similar. The language used for both Nineveh and Babylon the Great. Why? Because Nineveh was the great threat to Israel at that time and the great threat to humankind at that time in that part of the world. At the end of the tribulation, Babylon the Great will be the great threat to Israel at that time and the great threat to the world, because this is even going past the Antichrist, uh, past the mark of the beast. This is going right up to when Jesus is about 
to appear. And the language is very similar as it relates to their fall. They will fall with a great crash. So let me keep reading. I just wanted you to see the similarities. Very similar. Um, Verse 7, all who see you will flee from you and say Nineveh is in ruins and who will mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? Remember, um, Nahum means comfort. And this word here, where can I find anyone to comfort her? Uh, The Hebrew word, I looked this up, of course, because I'm no expert in Hebrew, as you know. I looked this up means to console, simply to console. Are you better than Thebes? That's an Egyptian city situated on the Nile. I'm going to show you a world famous map. And I'm going to put a map in your notes where you'll be able to see that. What's Thebes? Why is it talking about the Nile? With water around here, the river was her defense. The water's her wall. Similarities between the fall of Thebes, which the Assyrians did, and the fall of Nineveh, which the Babylonians will do. Uh, Cush and Egypt uh, were her boundless strength. Put and Libya were among her allies, yet she was taken captive, meaning Thebes and went into exile. Her infants were dashed into pieces at the head of every street. Lots were cast for nobles, and all her great men will be put to shame. You too. So just like that, just like what happened in Thebes, just what the Assyrians did to the people of Thebes, you too will become drunk, and you will go into hiding and seek refuge from the enemy. All of your fortresses are like fig trees with their first ripe fruit. When they are shaken, the figs fall into the mouth of the eater. Look at your troops. They are all women. Sorry, ladies. Obviously, Again, NIV 1984, uh, translating from the Hebrew into the language of 1984. Basically, what it is saying is that their troops are like untrained soldiers. They're not trained, they're not big enough, they're not strong enough. Uh, The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fires consume their bars. Draw water for the siege, strengthen your defenses. Work the clay, tread the mortar, repair the brickwork. There the fire will devour you, the sword will cut you down, and like, grass, and like grasshoppers consume you. Multiply like grasshoppers, multiply like locusts. You have increased the number of your merchants till they are more than the stars of the sky. Again, very similar to Revelation 18. Revelation 18, okay? The reference to merchants, right? Let me just get that back to you again. I just can't help but see the similarities between Nahum 3, talking about Nineveh, and of course... Um, uh, the merchants that it's talked about here. So let me um, take you over to that. Uh, Revelation 18 again. Find the right verses. Um, here it is. Um, Revelation 18, 11, The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stone, and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and, and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood, articles of every kind of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, right, and cargoes, right? It goes on and on. Again, very similar to the language here, the fall of Nineveh, the fall of Babylon, the great. So again, verse 16, you have increased the number of your merchants till they are more than the stars in the sky, but like the locusts, they strip the land and then fly away. Your guards are like locusts, your officials like swarms of locusts that settle on the walls on a cold day. But when the sun appears, they fly away and no one knows where. O king of Assyria, your shepherds slumber, your nobles lie down to rest. Your people are scattered on the mountains with no one to gather them. Nothing can heal your wound. Nothing can heal your wound. Your injury is fatal. Everyone who hears the news about you clasps his hands at your fall for who has not felt your endless cruelty, right? Everyone who hears your news clasps their hands at your fall. Again, look to Revelation 18 about what the people say, right? Um, everyone who um, clasps their hands, uh, pardon me, a- everyone um, who hears the news about you clasps their hands at your fall. That same kind of language is said here. Let me find it for you again. Um, verse 18 of Revelation 18. When they see the smoke of a burning, they will exclaim, was there ever a city like the great city? And they will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, woe, woe, O great city. Again, this destruction. And nothing can heal your wound. If you see that in uh, Nahum 3 verse 19, you see that reference uh, made in a couple of places, that the wound is fatal. It's an Old Testament phrase, nothing can heal your wound, the wound is fatal. In other words, the destruction of uh, Nineveh is, is going to be total and complete. So, 
All that being said, Revelation, uh, probably Revelation, I've said Revelation too much to you now. Um, Nahum chapter 3 talks about the doom, the inevitable doom of Nineveh. Now again, it's saying it before it happened. Now, it speaks about the fall of the city of Thebes. We know from our ancient history that Thebes fell in 663 BC. We know that Nineveh fell in 612 BC. So Nahum is written sometime between 66, 663 BC and I guess you'd have to say 613 BC. We don't know exactly when, and I touched on this at the beginning of the study, but there's about a 50-year slot here, sometime after Thebes fell. So if Thebes fell in 663, let's put 662. So sometime between 662 BC and 613 BC, um, Nahum is written. Nahum's talking about this. Nineveh is very much a city, the capital city of Assyria, but Nahum is writing about its inevitable doom. And that's why it is a comfort to the people of Israel, those that are left, because they will no longer be a threat. So, a few things that I like about this. And again, it's a little history and it's a little theology and I, I hope you'll be okay with this. So let me take the glasses off and look serious here. One of the things I like about the book of Nahum, and I've given you the four themes in, in, in our first study, but one of the things I really like about the book of Nahum is that it truly is a prophetic book. And it writes about something that is going to happen that hasn't yet happened. So that when it does happen and the people see that it happens, they can go, see, the prophet told us, see, God is right. God was true to his word. So I like the fact that you see here God is true to his word. I also like the fact that there's only about a 50-year gap here between the time, you know, Thebes falls and Nineveh falls. So if Nahum wrote somewhere in the middle there, Let's even cut it in half and say that he wrote in and around 630 BC. It only took about 20 or 30 years at the most for what Nahum prophesied to take place, which means this. The people that heard it saw it come to pass. If you were anywhere between zero and 40, because back in those days they didn't live as long, but if you were somewhere between zero and 40 back in those days, you heard Nahum prophesy this, or heard about it, and you actually saw it come to pass. Now remember, Nineveh is the baddest, meanest, biggest, greatest, richest, most sinful city in and around that area at that time. Nineveh is the crown jewel of the Assyrian Empire. It has defeated the Egyptians. It has defeated the northern kingdom of Israel. It has defeated all of the other towns and countries and villages in and around that area that I've given you maps about. It is the chief. And it would appear like nobody can knock it off its pedestal and that there's no hope for Judah and it's just a matter of time. But God says, I am against you. And Nahum predicts the inevitable doom of Nineveh and the people, a lot of the people back in those days that heard it for the first time and thought that could never happen, see it happen. God's word is true. It's always true. It will always be true. You can count on it. Everything that God has said that he has done, he has fulfilled. Everything that God said he will do that is yet to come, it may be out there yet, another 25 years, another 100 years, another 500 years, you and I don't know. But I can guarantee you folks, everything that the Bible says is going to happen before Jesus comes and when Jesus comes is going to happen. And it's little books like Nahum that remind us that the inevitable will come. If God says it's going to come, 
it's going to come, and it's going to come exactly in the way God said it would. Now, you and I don't have a problem with God saying something is going to come, and then it's going to come. You and I struggle with this, right? Well, what does the book of Revelation mean? What does the, you know, the last few chapters of Daniel mean? How do we understand 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians? How do we understand Matthew 24, 25, 26? You know? How do we understand that end time teaching? Well, we've got to sort that out. But God says it's going to come to pass, and it's going to come to pass, and you can take it to the bank. Absolutely. So you see here a reference in uh, Nahum chapter 3, verse 8. Are you better than Thebes? And the question is to Nineveh. Are you better than Thebes situated on the Nile? So again, this whole idea of God's word coming to pass. Now I'm going to put a map um, in your notes that I send to you on Wednesdays. I'm going to put a map uh, in your notes. And what you're going to see in this map is uh, you're going to see this area here where Nineveh is and Judah over here. And then a little bit further down, you're going to see on that map uh, Thebes. In the Bible, often known as No Ammon. Thebes. And the Assyrians destroyed, uh, no, the Assyrians conquered the city of Thebes in 663 BC. The Assyrian king was Asher uh, Banipal, Asher Banipal, and he captured the city in. Uh, 663, and um, it was down the Nile River. So if you're, you got to think about it this way. On your map, you'll see a little bit of this. I know you guys love it when I sketch a map. So this is the Arabian Peninsula. This is the Red Sea. And this is Egypt. And in and around this area, you've got Nineveh. And uh, over here, you've got uh, Judah. This is the, the Mediterranean Sea here. This is Africa. And this is the Mediterranean Sea. And Judah is here. And Thebes is down here, or No Ammon, N-O-A-M-O-N. And what happens is, is the Assyrians go all the way down here, over to Egypt, and conquer Thebes, which is in what we call the Upper Nile region. And this here is the Lower Nile. And this is where Cairo is today. So the Nile River runs to the Mediterranean Sea. So the lower means this is where it empties out. The upper means is where the Nile River starts. And the Nile River starts off in a number of different areas. There's the White Nile, the Blue Nile, and eventually it just becomes the Nile River. But the Assyrians went all the way down to Thebes and sacked the city, or took it over, and basically conquered what we know as ancient Egypt. And everything in this checkered area is conquered by the Assyrians. The only holdout is Judah. Now, there have been regions, areas around Judah and Judean cities that have been defeated, but Jerusalem still stands. So there's outlying cities, Lachish is one of them, and other cities that have been absolutely conquered. But Judah, at least the capital city, Jerusalem, and the surrounding area still stands. And the Assyrians come and they aren't able to conquer it. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But the whole idea here is all of this has been going on. So the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom was destroyed in 722 BC. Egypt in 663 BC. And now we're in this time in and around 650 to, you know, to 620 or 650 in and around to 613 BC, where Judah still stands. Judah still stands. 
And God has said, Nineveh, I am against you. You're not going to conquer Judah. You may have conquered everybody else, but I am going to stand against you. And he refers to, and it's very interesting, in verse 8 of Nahum 3, he refers to this city of Thebes, no Ammon, and he says, look, are you any better than Thebes? The irony in that is absolutely amazing. He's basically saying to Nineveh, are you any better than the city that you conquered? The city that you conquered that was on a river system. Uh, Nineveh is on the Tigris River uh, and uh, Thebes was on the Nile River. And he says, are you any better than that city? No, you're not. And he basically says to them, you're going to fall the same way you conquered Thebes. Very interesting. I'm, the tactics that you used on Thebes are going to be used on you. And so God is even not only predicting the inevitable doom of Nineveh, but how it will happen. So like the, the, the detail is incredible. Look what it says here. Are you better than Thebes situated on the Nile with water around her, right? It's a water city. The river was her defense, just like Nineveh on the Tigris. The water was her defense. And then it talks about its allies, that it had allies, just like Assyria had allies. Yet it says this, verse 10, yet she was taken captive and went into exiles. And then it talks about some of the destruction there. So you, you see all of, all of uh, th these big messages and little messages, the inevitable doom of Nineveh, how it will take place, right down to some of the details. It's, it's to be honest, I, I mean, again, for my nerd self, and I will admit I kind of nerd out on some of this stuff, it is absolutely um, fascinating. So over time, you've seen Samaria Falls. And don't worry, this will all be in your notes. If you can't see all this, don't worry, it'll be in your notes. Samaria Falls. Jerusalem goes under siege. Thebes falls. Looks like everything's going um, in Nineveh's way. And then finally in 612, Nineveh is destroyed. Folks, all of this happens in 90 years. Uh, on that map that you will get, I'm pretty sure that it gives some dates. Yes, it does. It gives some dates. Um, so on the map that I give you, it gives some dates about, um, oh, hang on here. Let me just make sure. No, it doesn't give dates, but don't worry. I'll, I'll give you some dates. But basically what happens between 722 and 612, uh, you know, basically the 700s being the zenith of Assyria's power. Assyria goes from the greatest power in that part of the world down to being destroyed. So again, let me just take the history and give it to you theological. There have been all kinds of times since the beginning of time where people or nations have tried to destroy God's people or tried to destroy the knowledge of God. And they have risen sometimes to great power and they've all crumbled, folks. Um, whether you're the Nebuchadnezzar of Daniel's time or you're the Asher Banipal of uh, 663 or you're the Sennacherib of uh, 701, the generals and the kings and the countries fall. God is always left standing. Germany, let's go back to recent history. Germany began to be under the influence of Adolf Hitler in 1933. And Hitler pulled off an amazing number of political wins in order to become, you know, the chancellor over um, Germany. He outsmarted a number of politicians and, um, 
and then sometimes just eliminated other kinds of political threats. But in the early 30s, there was always the possibility that Germany could turn the corner and go, go a better way. But Hitler, Hitler and the brown shirts finally take over in 33. They gear up for six years. They do some land grabs. You know, they grab uh, part, of Czech, uh, part of the Czech Republic. They grab part of Alsace-Lorraine in France. Uh, you know, they march troops in and peacefully take over Austria in 1938. They grab some pieces of, of Poland and that in the, uh, the Prussia area, and they consolidate their, their land. And then in 1939, September the 1st, 1939, they declare war. And in 1939, 1940, 1941, Germany looked invincible. And had Great Britain not been an island nation, it would have fallen probably, you know, months after France. But because Germany, you know, tried to spread its, thin, its troops too thin, Eastern Front, Western Front, plus fighting in Africa, so really three fronts, you know, the clock was ticking on them. But nonetheless, you know, even in 1942, when things started to turn against them, there was always the chance that, who knows, they might, they might come out of this okay. If they, get a, if they get a win at Stalingrad, if they could just overcome Leningrad, if the Africa Corps could just do a little bit better in Africa, who knows, right? That all could have changed. But, but for 1939 to 41, they looked invincible. And then by May 1945, they were gone. Now, millions died, millions died. And it was absolutely tragic. But the German Reich, who Hitler said would last a thousand years, didn't do 13. Think about that. Now, in that time, again, irrevocable damage all over the world. But they didn't last 13 years. Russia as an empire, right? The USSR, uh, America's biggest threat, you know, started in 1917 and by 1989 and shortly thereafter, the 15 republics broke into a bunch of minor ones and we know the mess we're in today with Russia and Ukraine. But the bottom line is, is it is not, it is a ghost of what it was too. China is now on the rise and is probably legitimately the world's biggest threat right now because it's got the people and the economy and the nukes to go with it. So all of these things happen, and you and I sometimes freak out a little bit and say, oh, what's going to happen? What's God going to do? And stories like Nahum remind us that what men raise up, God can take down in a moment. What men raise up, God can absolutely take down in a moment. Let me take you to Revelation 18 again. And look what it says about the last great threat on the world. Look what it says there in the last great threat. Um, let me get the, the, the right verse again. Verse 21 of Revelation 18. With such violence, the great city of Babylon was thrown down, never to be found again, right? Just like Nineveh, it, just like Nineveh, right? Never to be found again. Nineveh went desolate for hundreds and hundreds of years until it was eventually uh, dug up. Um, so just the whole idea that it was raised up and then it absolutely disappeared. But there's another verse that I want to read for you here. I just got to find it again. I saw it my last time we, we uh, turned here. Um, give me a moment, talk amongst yourselves at home. It's, it's speaking about how quick it happened. Let me just find it. Let me just find it. I might have to put it in your notes because I'm struggling to find it, but it talks about it being raised up and fallen in an hour. 
And some of you are following along at home thinking, Pastor Brent, it's in this verse, it's in this verse, and I can't find it right away quickly, but you're sitting there. Um, let me just take another moment here. Hannah will put a really nice commercial in the midst of this. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät, das Küstenwächter. Das Gerät, das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Okay, over. I mean, we are sinking. We are sinking. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. What are you thinking about? Oh, there it is. I knew I would find it. In Revelation 18, it talks about Babylon the Great, this last big world threat. Revelation 18, verse 9, it says, In one hour she was brought to ruin. Now again, you were saying, well, Pastor Brent, you're talking from the book of Nahum. Why are you talking about uh, you know, Babylon the Great, because uh, here's the connection, is, is God proof to Nineveh that when he's against them, even though they're the most powerful empire in the world, down they went. I've already told you from history that the historians tell us, those that have read the documents from way back when, that it took three months for Nineveh to fall. Three months. That's it. This huge capital city, three months. Once the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians went after it, it fell in three months. It says the Babylon the Great at the end of time in one hour. Now, one hour doesn't necessarily mean 60 minutes, but it means this very quickly. It's, it's a word picture. It's a metaphor. One hour means it happened very suddenly. This great last end time empire that looks like it's going to be a real threat to God falls in a very short time. Why? Because God said about it, I am against you. So, Folks, don't fear what humankind is doing. Don't fear what the Russians are doing. Don't fear what the Chinese are doing. Don't fear what the Americans are doing. Look, I'm a, I'm a bit of a news junkie, as you know. I follow what's going on in the world like you do. And yes, when these things happen, they can be a little bit scary. But don't think for one minute that the United States or Great Britain or France or Italy or Germany or Russia or China or Japan or even the crazy guy in North Korea, don't think that those guys are going to disrupt or, or stop God's plans. God is going to fulfill his time. He promises Nahum uh, this, that Nahum's going to be a comforter to the people of Israel, and Nineveh is no longer going to set foot on their territory because God is going to get in the way. Now, we know the Babylonians are coming, and that's a whole other story for a whole other time. But at this particular time, God says, no way, not any further than this. So what are some of the references here that we could refer to? Because I'm, I'm really concerned about making this applicable to you. So the first thing is, the application is this. You could trust God's word. If God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. The people of Judah heard Nahum's word. They would have thought, no way Nineveh could ever fall. It's too big, too strong, and too powerful. Nahum says it does. And people at that day and age are around. They live long enough to actually see it happen. And they would have gone, wow. Nineveh fell. Nahum was right. But the other thing is this, that if God is against them, he's also saying this. I need to find some room here. Let me put it over here. I am for you. Hey, Judah, it's not just that I'm against Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire because they're so bad. And there's wonderful descriptions there of the warfare and the slaughter. And yeah, they're bad and bad things happen to those bad people. But he's also telling us, hey, hey, Judah, I'm for you. So God isn't just against things. God is for things. So let me illustrate this to you in maybe a bit of a, an interesting way. But first, I paused long enough that Hannah's got uh, opportunity here for a couple of inserts, but got my bottle of Coke back. My wife takes good care of me. You know that.
but I have been talking a lot. So God is not just against Nineveh. He's for Israel. God is not just against your enemies and evil. God is for you. Um, and I want you to remember that when you're going through tough times and it feels like things are stacked against you, I'm going to take you to a familiar passage of scripture, but I do want you to think about it. Romans chapter eight, Romans chapter eight, verse 28, Romans eight, verse 28. And I know many of you know this, and we know that in him, all things, God works for the good of those who love him. So God is at work for your good because you love him. That doesn't mean bad things don't happen, but God is at work for your good even when bad things happen, right? We live in a broken world. We are subject to the laws of this, this broken world. Bad things happen. I get old, you get old. We get sick, you get sick, right? There's car accidents and parking tickets. Um, you know, there's financial crisis. There's health crisis. There's family crisis. We are not exempt from trouble. But, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. That's us. And who've been called according to his purpose. That's us. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. We were made to be like Jesus. We don't become little gods. We were made to be like Jesus in the sense of growing in holiness and purity. That he might be the firstborn from among brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he just called, he also justified. And those he justified, we also glorified, right? In other words, what... what what Paul is saying there is God's working for your good, even in, in, in bad things. He's also saying, and God's got your life planned. He, he called you, he justified you, and he will glorify you. You will, you will get to your eternal reward. God's got you. And then he goes on to say this, um, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, famine or nakedness or danger or sword? There are real dangers out there. Will that separate you or me from the love of God? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And then he finally answers it. Look, yes, there's risk out there. No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord, right? So in other words, what he is saying is, is that God is for us. All of that is just, uh, you know, a long way to say God is for us. God is for you. God was for Jacob. God was for Israel. And he's going to spare them back in those days. And there's a comforting word coming through the prophet Nahum. But God is also for us. And so I, I just want you to remain that, that God is for us, not against us. So remember that. So again, challenging you and me, what are you against? Because I think there's an application here to, to talk about. What are you against? Well, I'm, I'm, against, um, I'm against abortion. Um, I don't want to see um, mothers abort babies, right? And you might say, well, there are exceptions, you know, maybe if the mother's life is at risk or the mother was raped or something. And then you might say, but if the woman was willing to go through with the, with the delivery, you'd like to see that happen, right? Very complicated issue sometimes. You know, we're definitely against late-term abortion. We're against abortion for any and every reasons. We might see some wiggle room for, for that. We're against euthanasia. We don't want people who are sick and dying or old people to take their own lives or to be given assistance, right? Uh, assistance. Uh, you've heard a lot about it lately, MAID, M-A-I-D, or medical assistance in death. You know, they don't like you to call it, uh, you know, a suicide or doctor-assisted suicide. It's, it's medical assistance in death that cleans it up. But the whole idea is if you're too sick and you can't be cured or you're too old, maybe we'll let you take, um, take, take uh, again, maybe get assistance, medical assistance, but take your own life. And we're like, well, I don't know. Should we do that? You know, just because you're old, should you be allowed to take your life? Just because you've got an illness, should you be allowed to take your life? Yeah, I understand you're in pain, but should you be allowed to take your life? You know, if you've got Alzheimer's, and you made a note years ago when you were healthy that if that happened, you know, we could take your life. Um, 
I don't know what the numbers are in the world, but I know Canada does a lot of that for a country of 40 million people. We do a lot of that. So I don't know about that. You know, I don't know. I'm, I, I think maybe I'm against that. Uh, I'm against, uh, you know, using too much oil and too much gas. It's, it's polluting our country. It's, uh, it's heating up our, uh, our planet. Maybe, maybe you're against that. Um, you know, um, there's lots of things we are against. God is against Nineveh. Folks, what are you for? Right? Often when politicians are out on, on the, the, the political trail, out on the stump, they'll tell you a lot of what they're against. Well, I'm against what my opponent wants. I'm against this. I'm against that. Well, sometimes what we want to hear from people is, what are you for? So if you're against abortion, that means you're for life, right? Well, absolutely, Pastor. So you're not only for life of uh, unborn babies, but you're also for the life of somebody who's old, right? Because it's not just little kids or unborn little kids that matter, right? Older people matter too. Even sick people matter, right? Yeah, I'm for that. So what are you doing? What are you doing to tell people that you're for that? What, what are you actively doing? You might be shouting, I'm against certain things, but what are you doing to be for life, whether it's young life or old life. If you're against polluting the world, you know, are you moving from a gas car to an electric car, right? What, like, not just what are you against, what are you for? As Christ followers, we are against sin and evil, but we're also for Jesus and for the proclamation of the gospel and for goodness, right? And we're, so let's make sure that we're not just vocal against the things that we are opposed to, but also let's be vocal and active for the things that we support as well, whether it's life or a healthy, clean rivers and lakes and those kinds of things. Because I think sometimes Christians are just known as people who shout against things. You know, we're against abortion, we're against, quote, uh, you know, other kinds of lifestyles and those kinds of things, which sometimes takes the approach that because we're against alternate lifestyles, that we're against people who live in alternate lifestyles. And I think that the church isn't against people in alternate lifestyles. I think the church is for truth. And yeah, we're against sin, but the church is for truth. And we feel that the Bible is compelling us to tell people who are living contrary to God's word that that's... that's um, they're following a lie and they're living a life that isn't good for them and it's not God's best for them and that possibly, you know, there's judgment for them as well. So we're asking them to turn their way to repent, just like Jonah told Nineveh, you know, back in the 800 BCs, you know, repent and they did, they forsake their lifestyle. Uh, Jonah did that reluctantly, but we as Christ followers are trying to tell people of our day uh, to repent and turn to God. Look, folks, there are, there are probably 100,000 Ninevehs out there today that need a voice, that need a, a modern prophet, if I can put it that way, that need a voice and some love from Christians saying, look, that's not what God has for you. That's not what God wants for you. You are believing lies about some of these lifestyle choices and behavioral choices that you are living, and you're going to fall under judgment from that. You're going to find out that if you're not careful, God's going to be against you. But we as Christ followers are saying, look, but God loves you and we love you and we're just doing our best to tell you the truth from the Bible, God's word, and that you turn from your evil ways and be saved. So Nahum's message is our message today. Um, Nahum is saying, look, Nineveh, you had a choice, you turned away for it, and now judgment's calling. We're telling people today, you know, make a choice, make a decision with the gospel. Maybe the first time you heard the gospel, maybe the seventh time or the 700th time, but until judgment comes, you still have a chance to turn away from your sin. And so I just want us in the church to be, yeah, we're against stuff and we're against sin, just like God was, but we're also for God and we're for his message and we're for people and we're for people turning it around and having a change of heart and experiencing the love of God. We're for all of that as well. But the sobering message is that if you challenge God and go against God, judgment might come. So I'm going to stop there today, which means 
One more week left. Next week, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to take you to 2 Kings, and I'm going to take you to Isaiah, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you how God delivered Judah from Assyria about 80 years before Assyria finally fell. So we're going to go back in time a little bit. We're going to go from 612 BC when Nineveh fell. We're going to go back in time a little bit to around 700, 701 BC. And we're going to see how God miraculously delivered Judah from Assyria. Yeah, everything else around them fell, but Judah didn't. And so Judah is still standing the day Nineveh falls. And they're able to say, aha, you thought you were going to get us, but God got you. So that's up next week. We'll wrap it all, wrap it up and uh, look forward to having you with us. Remember, if you have any input, pastor at EssexGospel.com. Bye for now. God bless.